this one. That is over if you go between, if you go up to the second floor of the business building and you walk towards the college center. Uh, right before you get to the doors that leads you to the college center and the VP's office, there's a little ledge there. And there's a mama robin who has a couple of baby robins. And you can kind of see one that <laughs> lighter patch is a bird. I saw it move, all right? And the blue thing is apparently an egg. I, I wish I would have brought my better camera. Um, the nice thing is, is with the glass there, you know, it's heavy glass and, and, and I don't think you can see into it. Uh, you know, it doesn't know that I'm there, so it doesn't freak it out. So you can, you can snap a, a pretty decent picture. So anyhow, there's signs of spring all around. Um, here's what we're going to do today. Uh, as you know, um, there are uh, the, the um, what was I going to say? Totally blank. Oh, the people from uh, Friends from the Start are going to be in lab today. So you can, you, anyone that's doing that project. Um, and if no one's, I think there's at least one person doing that project, right? A couple, two of us, good. All right. Yeah, I know, I know, yeah. I was going to say, uh, and if, you're, if, you know, if no one's here doing that project, some of you will need to pretend that you're doing the project, right? <laughs> right? Uh, but, <coughs> yeah, right. You know, Rich, take his. You know, to get get a copy of his code real quick, and yeah. yeah. But anyhow, yeah, he'll be in lab to answer any of your questions and and to see what you've done and, and that sort of thing. Uh, also, the um, service learning uh, celebration is tomorrow. Um, you're supposed to have registered. If you haven't, send someone an email. <laughs> I don't know who. Look on the service learning page. There's there's probably something, or you can ask me, or just show up. I don't think. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's at the end of the semester, and, and really, you know, um, I, I, I think I think my attention towards trivial things <laughs> is becoming small. Or like, did did you register or not? I actually didn't get a copy of the agenda, so I wonder if I forgot to register. I'm almost certain I did, but when I didn't get a copy of the agenda, someone else emailed it to me. Um, all right. Today, what we're going to do in class? Yes. Where is it? I don't know. Uh, they sent me agenda, I think, because I'm faculty. I don't think they would send it to everyone. Um, lot, uh, I know the, the program proper is up on the second floor of the library. There's supposed to be lunch, and I don't know if they're feeding us up there or if they're feeding us downstairs while walking up there. So um, go on the second floor of the library. Uh, or e in the College Center, and look out for me, and, and, and I'll direct you. All right. Pardon me? I think lunch actually starts a little earlier. I think it starts like 11.45 or something. All right. <clears throat> today, uh, what are we doing today? Today, we are going to look at making your JavaScript a little more efficient, because um, we, we got it to work last time, and we did it, I think, even a couple ways. But our code was a little tough to read because we strung along like three statements. And between all the semicolons and quotes and this and that and the other, it's, it's sort of easy to get confused. And one of the things that, that, that I talked about <coughs> uh, uh, continuously in, in all my classes is really a, a primary concern is maintainability for your code because you know it's going to change. You might not know what's going to change about it. You know, no one has a, a crystal ball. No one can, can tell the future. But you know that there is going to be some kind of change. Well, they say the only constant is change, right? So um, you, you know, it, it's not really enough to be a good software developer, and again, web developer as well, to make stuff that works, to elevate it above the passable level, make it maintainable. And our JavaScript right now isn't very maintainable for a couple reasons. First of all, it worked with three pictures. What if I had five more pictures? Well, that's an awful lot of code to be duplicating over and over and over again. Um, the, um, slogan for programmers and web developers ought to be this. DRY. 
You want to be a dry web developer. All right, what does that mean? It means do not repeat yourself. And we can think of all the different ways that we've, we've, we've strived not to repeat ourselves uh, in this class, right? When we take our CSS and put it in an external file, why do we do that? We do that so you're not repeating yourself, right? So if you make a change in one place, it handles every page as opposed to having to go into every single page. So a lot of good programming practices can be summarized by do not repeat yourself. If you can, if you can write the code so that if something changes, you change one thing, then it's probably better code than if something changes, you have to change a half dozen things. I will say the point of this class isn't to make you JavaScript experts, but sort of just expose you to the basic ideas here. So you should be able to do the last part, the, the JavaScript part of the lab with the stuff that we've talked about prior to today. And if you're having trouble, I can, I can review that with you. So today, we're going to look at fine tuning it a little bit, all right, to make your life a little bit easier. If you're having trouble understanding what I'm talking about, you know, Close your eyes and think pleasant thoughts for 20 minutes or so, all right? Think about the nice bird that, that we saw up there, the mama bird with her, with her baby birds, or I don't know, think of a, a unicorn or, you know, <laughs> whatever, whatever gives you pleasant thoughts, think of that uh, as I go on. But, but what our goal today is to take the code that worked last time and make it work better. And we're going to do that in stages, all right? I'm going to pick one of the examples we did last time. Let's see. Let's see which one I want to go with. We'll go with this one. We'll go with our second version of the gallery, the one that had divs that we were showing and hiding. And if you remember, our code looked like this. All right, the page looked like that. <clears throat> As we put our mouse over the different cats, the div showed, the, the proper div showed, and the other divs were hidden. Now again, this is with three pictures. All right, our code looks like this. All right. This is a nice example to show sort of the interplay of the three pieces of a web page, the three components of a web page. HTML being the content and the logical organization. All right? I have a logical organization, uh, or organization uh, a section of the page that's the navigation or the thumbnails. I then have a section of the page for each of the three cats. All right? So I've logically divided the page. Now, I haven't done anything with the physical layout yet, right? Because that's not the job of HTML. The job of HTML is to provide the content and the logical organization, the stuff that's grouped together. The CSS then does the appearance and the physical layout, all right? And in this case, we do a couple things with the appearance. Number one, we make one of them visible and the other two hidden. And number two, we set the position of all three of them so that they overlay over top of each other. So as we move our mouse around, those divs show up in the same place. So, it look, you know, so that area is swapping out. Really, we're making the one visible and making the others invisible. All right? Now, we do that through our standard recipe of JavaScript, which is a user event gets the ball rolling. In our case, on the image, on the thumbnails, we have an on mouse over event. Now, sometimes people get confused uh, about where to put the events. Sometimes people would think that you might do something like this. Well, I want to change that, so I'll put the event on that. No. That's what's changing. All right? What instigates the change, what causes the change to happen is when you put your mouse over the thumbnail. So that's where the user event lives. All right? So we have on this an on mouse over event that uses a DOM, document, get element by ID, Simba, style, visibility, equals, hidden. 
document, get element by ID, Jackson, style, visibility, hidden. Document, get element by ID, Clio, style, visibility, hidden. In each of these, each of these JavaScript statements, or visible rather, each of these JavaScript statements uh, are separated by semicolons. They use the DOM to point to something on the page. Document says, hey, something on the page. Get element by ID says, point to the thing on the page that has that ID, because we're going to do something to it. What are we going to do to it? We're going to change its style. What about the style are we going to change? We're going to change its visibility. And what are we going to set the visibility to? We're going to set it to visible. Through our JavaScript code, we're setting these exact same attributes that we defined up here. So our CSS, we can sort of give an initial value for those, but we can go and change those. Just like we saw other examples where we change the SRC attribute. Uh, any of the attributes on the page, we can change through JavaScript. We first have to point to the thing that we want to change, and typically what you use is get element by ID. There's other methods of doing it too, but typically that's what you use, because that points to the one thing on the page that we want to change. And then we write a little JavaScript statement to change that. Now, there's two things I don't like about this code. And we're going to fix it in increments. We're going to fix one of the things first, and then we're going we're to fix the second thing. All right? The first thing I don't like about this is the readability of it. All right? In other words, that's a hard statement to read. Someone suggested putting it on other lines. Let's see if that works. Okay, that works. So that can make it a little bit readable. A little bit more readable, rather. All right, so that was a good suggestion. But still, it's kind of confusing to see smack dab in the middle of your page of HTML see a bunch of JavaScript. And again, a three lines of JavaScript isn't much. In larger JavaScript, you're going to be talking about dozens of lines of code. So the one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to group these statements together and put them somewhere else. And I'm just going to call that code from here. So I don't have three lines of code, I have one line of code in my, um, in my, uh, embedded in my HTML. For those of you who have done programming before, any sort of programming, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a function. All right? What is a function? A function is a set of lines of code that you can set aside, give a name to it, and then when you call that function, it goes and executes those lines of code. All right? Um, it's like defining a little procedure, you know. Um, let's, let's look on the door. Let's see, let's see what we have here. All right. There's defined here a procedure for tornadoes. One, two, three, four, five steps. Stuff that you should do. All right? So, Ideally, we would all be trained to know what those five steps are. All right? So everyone's probably going to look on the way out to make sure we know what they are. All right? And then, if there actually was a tornado, I shouldn't have to say the five steps. Those have been defined, and we should all know them. All I would need to say is, do the tornado procedure. Right? And you should know all the five different steps that you're supposed to do. Think of a function that way. I'm going to take the lines of code, I'm going to take the instructions, I'm going to put it aside, and whenever I want to do those lines of code, I, I don't have to say do this, 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 and this. I just say do that procedure, and that procedure handles it. So what I'm going to do like this is I'm going to cut this out of here, and I'm going to go up into the head section, this code lives with the style sheet up in the head section. Repeat that, please. No. 
CSS is only for CSS code. You can build external JavaScript codes if you have JavaScript um, that's shared among pages. So you can do a very similar thing. We're not going to talk about that just because, again, we're, we're, our goal isn't to make you JavaScript experts. The one thing I will say is typically it's more common for JavaScript to be specific for a, cert, for a specific page, all right, um, as opposed to um, CSS, which is pretty common to be shared among pages. So it's less of a big deal with JavaScript to have it embedded in the page because usually the stuff that we're going to do is going to be specific to this page. I create a function that's going to be show Clio. And I'm going to put this, those lines of code in here. All right. Save it. I'll come back and review it in a little more detail, but we'll save it. Let's make sure it still works. Okay, it doesn't. Um, I wonder if I messed up the language declaration. Maybe not. No fair, you're paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, next thing you're gonna tell me is you read the book too. No, I didn't get that. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I thought I thought I made a, a ish, uh, I thought I I put that in incorrectly. All right, so I call. So what did I do? I created a function. How do you create a function? In the head section, and again, it's best to do it in the head section. Because the head section guarantees that all that gets loaded before you get into the body to actually try to call the function. All right. I create a script tag that says, just like the style tag tells the browser, hey, you're not in HTML land anymore, you're in CSS land. The script tag says you're not in HTML land, you're in JavaScript land. I have the word function. I have the name that I'm going to give those, like Tornado instructions, all right. This is show Clio. I have two parentheses, opening and closing, and we'll get to what those do in a minute here, all right. I then have these curly brackets, sometimes called, or braces, sometimes called. In JavaScript, braces are used to group stuff together. So in other words, in this case, this brace says where the function begins. This brace says where the function ends. So everything between here and here is, uh, is considered part of that function. To call the function, I just give the name of the function. Show Clio. All right. And again, that makes the code much more concise in the HTML. You know, it doesn't get in my way. I don't have a long line. I don't have multiple lines. It's just calling that one function. Now, be pretty straightforward to see how I can make a show Simba and a show Jackson function just by changing things around a little bit. And then I'll call each of these functions. So now my HTML code looks very clean. All right, we have my event, and my event is just calling the function, and then the function up here has the details of what I'm going to do. What 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 are the instructions that are part of that function? All right, so I've given these instructions a name, and then I can just use that name to call it. 
So I go and do this, and we should still be working. And we are. Now, so we, we, we've greatly improved the readability of this. All right? Now, there's things that you can do in JavaScript to make your JavaScript code more readable still. For example, notice how that brace, or rather the end brace, matches up with the function. When you get into more involved functions, you might have if statements and loops and all kinds of other things inside of it, and they'll have braces of their own. This is almost like lining up your start tag with your end tag in your HTML. By lining up the braces, it helps you keep straight what goes with what. So at a glance, I could take my glasses off and look. And assuming that I knew that this was JavaScript code, I know that these, strong, these instructions are part of that function, even though I can't read it. How? Because I see that brace goes with that. Now you don't have to do that, right? The, the, the browser figures out what you want to do, so that proper indenting is for your benefit, to make sure that you can read the code. The other thing that you can do is you can put comments in. Comments are like little lines of code that, again, the browser ignores, but will help you understand what you're doing in the code. For example, hide the div for rest of cats then show Clio. Something like that. You can just put some kind of explanation that explains what you're going to do. It's best not to make your... Um, it is best to, to, to describe why you're doing something as opposed to saying what you're doing. For example, anyone that can read JavaScript knows that this is setting the visibility attribute of Simba to hidden. But explain why you're doing it. Okay? I want to hide the rest of the cats and show Cleo because the mouse has gone over, over Cleo's picture. All right. So we made a, a big advance in the readability of this. All right. One thing to say, JavaScript is very picky. All right. HTML is a lot more forgiving. In other words, um, <coughs> even with XHTML, if you were to use a capitalized tag name, it'll figure it out most of the time. It'll know what to do most of the time. In JavaScript, if you mess up the capitalization of something, it doesn't know what to do. Now again, there's some things that are built into the DOM where you have to follow the naming conventions. For example, document get element by ID, that's built into the DOM. So you have no choice in spelling it that way. Now the function name, show Cleo, show Simba, show Jackson, is something I made up. So I just have to make sure that I'm consistent. So, for example, if I call the function show Cleo, and when I call it, I use a lowercase s for show Cleo, it's not going to work. How do you know what went wrong? Well, troubleshooting JavaScript in itself is a challenge. All right? I found that browsers other than Internet Explorer tend to report the errors in a more understandable way. So, how can you tell the errors in JavaScript? If you go up to Tools, whoops, Error Console, you'll see, and it says, Show Clio is not defined. Well, you might say, well, wait a minute. Show Clio is defined. It's right here. Oh, it said show Clio with an uppercase S. All right. So there's a certain number of errors that are very common in, in writing JavaScript. And getting the case of things right, you know, is one of those very common errors. It's a mistake a lot of people, people make. Likewise, if I were to make a mistake here, let's say on show Jackson, and use a capital D, all right, that also won't work. If I look at the error console, it shows me that document get element by ID is not a function. Well, wait a minute, it is a function. I've used it a million times. Let's look at my notes. Oh, 
is lowercase d. One thing you can do is you can use alert statements to help you see where you've gotten. For example, let's say I go back to this mistake to show Clio. And let's pretend I, I didn't notice that it's lowercase. And I go and it doesn't work. I look at my error counselor and it says, show Clio's not defined. Oh, wait a minute, I know it's defined. One thing I could do is I could put an alert in there. And you can just put something as simple as this, the word alert. And then in quotes, some message. Hello. All right. When I run this, if that instruction gets hit, it'll pop up a little box that says hello. Otherwise, it won't. So in this case, it's not going to because there's an error. You can't find that function. All right. Now, if I go and fix that function, ah, there I got the little hello. It's useful, too, if your function kind of works, but doesn't work completely. So I could do this. Let's mess up this statement. I could put in, in uh, a series of alerts. And, whoops, that'll help me determine exactly where this thing stopped working. So, put my mouse over Clio. The one displayed, so we got to that statement. The two displayed, the three displayed. Oh, oh duh, I thought I messed that one up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Evaluations are already filled out. <laughs> There's no amended return like with your taxes. Okay, now, one displays, two displays, three displays. Ooh, four doesn't display. Well, I can pretty well bet the problem is between three and four, so it's with that statement. So that can kind of help you diagnose what's going wrong. Almost every programming language you have has some version of this kind of thing, you know, where you can, you can just display uh, uh, some debugging code to, to help you figure out what's going wrong. All right. Now, we've made substantial improvements to this, but still, <laughs> are we completely dry? No. <laughs> Why are we not completely dry? Yeah, because I have an awful lot of code that looks like exactly the same. All right? And that would become even more dramatic if I added a few more cats, right? I would have to have five functions in, let's say if I added two more cats instead of three. And each one of those, the functions would be almost the same except for one thing, the, the cat that I'm making visible. In other words, for Simba, I would hide Cleo, hide Jackson, Hide Kovu, hide Kiara, show Simba. For Jackson, I would hide Cleo, hide Simba, hide Kiara, hide Kovu, show Jackson, and so on. I'm trying to remember all the names of my cats. All right. Now, what can we do to remedy this? Any thoughts of what we could do to remedy this? Either you two folks. Yeah. What I can do is, really, the only difference between these functions I'm hiding the rest, and I'm showing one. Each function looks the same. So, if instead of having a separate function for each of those, I can write a generic function that will go in, and I'll tell it when I run the function which cat I want to show, and it will hide everyone and show that cat. Think of Excel, for example. All right? um, there's a square root function in Excel. Right? You know, let's open up Excel. We have it here. I think we do. All 
All right. We, we have Excel. So let's go in and say let's do this. Let's make a little square root chart. We could say one, two, we can copy this all the way down. All right. All right. Then I can go and I can say equals square root of the cell. And I can copy that all the way down. And it shows me the square root. I use the same function, right? There's only one square root function, right? Square root. There's not, and this is a ridiculous example, I know, but there's not a square root function for 1, a square root function for 2, a square root function for 3, and so on down the line. There's one square root function, and then when you run that function, you tell it what you want the square root of. So in this case, I want the square root of the contents of cell A4. In this case, I want the square root of the contents of A8, and so on down the line. We can do a similar thing. We could write a function... A generic show hide cat function, all right, that takes an argument and shows that cat, all right. Now, in the case of Excel, my argument is the cell that I want to do the square root of, all right. What do you suppose the argument will be in this case? What am I going to tell my function to do? piece of data am I going to pass it so it knows what to do? Yeah, the cat's name, true, but more specifically, I'm going to pass in the name of the div that I want to show. All right. That way, if someone wants to adapt this and has dogs, all right, they don't have to pass the cat name in, they can pass the name of the div, all right, the dog div instead of the cat div, or the automobile div or, or whatever. They can just pass the name of the div in. So that's going to be the argument to my function. All right? So I'm going to save this. Then I'm going to save a second version just so that we, just so I don't eliminate this, this one. You know, just so we have both versions. So I'm going to write a generic show cat function. And I'm putting in parentheses arg cat. All right. What is that? That's called an argument to the function. It's like the cell that I want to do the square root of. It's additional information. Yeah, you want to show cat, but which cat? Yeah, you want to do the square root, but the square root of what? And so on. So it's like additional information. It's the, oper it's, it's the operands that your function is going to work on, right? You could write an add function to add th two things together. Well, what are the two things you want to add together? They'll be your arguments, all right? The name argcat, I'm going to use as a placeholder for the actual values that I give it. Now. In this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little shortcut because there's a couple ways that we could do this, but I'm going to take a shortcut. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to hide all the cats, all right? And then I'm going to show the one cat that I said I want to want to um, show. So let me go in and copy some code. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to hide all the cats. So I hide Simba, I hide Jackson, I hide Cleo. 
then I'm going to show the one that I want to show. Well, I don't always want to show Cleo. How do I know which cat I want to show? Yeah, whatever the value of that argument is. So I'm going to take that placeholder and I'm going to plug it in here. Hey, whichever cat you said you wanted to show, go ahead and show it. Absolutely. You could send more than one argument. Now, one thing to notice, and this is confusing for some people the first time, is notice our cat is not enclosed in quotes where Cleo and Jackson and Simba are. If you're talking about what we call hard-coded value, in other words, an exact value, I want to ha hide Jackson, then it's in quotes because that's what's called a literal. Actually that. Our cat is an example of a variable. In other words, I don't want to hide a div called our cat. I'm going to put in the, the argument our cat, the name of the div I want to hide, and whatever name is in there, that's the one I want to hide. All right? So now, I can go in and I can change all these to say show cat and I can pass the name of the cat that I want to show. Oops. Let's go and save this. Let's go and open this. And no. Well, let's follow our. Repeat that, please. I open cat one side HTML. Yeah. All right. What's it telling me? Document get element by ah. Uh, I saw my error in there when I was demonstrating the errors. Well, because it's a statement that doesn't. It's all one function. It hits a statement that says I don't know what to do with this. I give up. All right. There we go. All righty now. Choo, choo. And it works, and it's only in one function. Let me go back and correct the other one, otherwise students will be confused and they'll be cursing the fact that they've already filled out the evaluation. Well, wait, well, wait a minute. Online students may not have filled in the evaluation yet because theirs is more open-ended. They have a they have a, a different time frame. So, ooh, yeah, yeah. Oh, too late. Yeah, no, I'm I'm just kidding. All right. So, let me make sure that one works. Yeah. All right. Now, let's, let's, let's do a mental experiment and think what we would need to do if we added another cat. All right. If we added another cat, what would we need to do? We'd need to create the div for it. All right. We'd need to create the thumbnail for it. All right. We'd need to make sure that there's a mouse over that thumbnail that says to show that cat. All right. And we'd need to add that cat to the script to hide it. All right. Notice none of those things are really a repeat. You know, we're, we're doing, let me, let me, I'll, I'll come back and I'll, I'll clarify that in a second. None of those things from the JavaScript perspective is a repeat. We're not, we only add, we add a line of code here and we put another image with and call that cat's function. All right. So really from a JavaScript perspective, we're not repeating ourselves. Now you might say, well, we kind of have duplicate, we, we have very similar HTML for each of the cats. That's true. 
that's something that we can't really do client side. We would do something like that server side. Maybe we would have a database of the cats that we had and we would use the database on the server to come up with that. Now, God forbid that I have that many cats, so I need to keep a database of them, all right? But that's how you would do it. Uh, so, uh, so I guess what I'm saying is from a client-side perspective, this is, this is pretty, pretty solid. Uh, really, there's not a lot we could do to improve this, all right? Um, any questions about this? Yes? Can you um, call a function from within? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we could take these. Make a function called hide all. We don't really need to pass an argument to that because we're hiding all of them. Call that function in there, and then it would work the same. Um, this one would I would say that is a personal preference. You know, six of one, half dozen the other. Typically, what you want to do is 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 if a function gets to be so big that you can't see the whole thing on the screen at the same time you probably want to break it down into separate functions. Uh, in this case, both this way and the other way was a manageable number of lines of code. So unless I had reason to suspect that I would need to hide these cats, <laughs> sounds, sounds silly saying it that way, hide these images or hide these divs from some other place on the page, there's probably no real advantage to doing it that way, but that is a great question. Uh, and, and you, yes, you can absolutely call multiple functions. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, any, any of your basic coding that you can do in in other languages, uh, you can do in JavaScript. So you can do loops, arrays, if statements. Um, you can create JavaScript objects if you want. You know, uh, you know there's really no limitations. This is just really uh, a taste of the capability. Yes. You could do that via JavaScript. Uh, the, the question was, is could you use JavaScript to generate the different divs? All right. Uh, you could. You wouldn't make the div cat, right? Because then you wouldn't. It would be hard to show or hide. You'd, you'd make the you'd make the div have the cat name on it. But you could loop through and you could generate a div for the however many cats you had based on an array. You could do that in JavaScript. Typically, though, that functionality is done on the server as opposed to uh, on the client. Um, because typically, if you're going to that much trouble, you're probably pulling the values from a database, in, in which case that would indicate that you do the code on the server side. So yeah, you, I, I could go and make an array, loop through it, create the HTML for, um, for uh, each of the divs, but um, for smaller problems, that would be overkill. For bigger problems, you'd probably do it on the server via a database. Other questions? Yes? Um, is there a way to simply store which cat or which div is being visible in, in an argument or a variable and then just call up hide this argument, which is the one that's being displayed, instead of having 20 different lines saying hide everybody? Yeah. Um, the, the question is, the question was, is could I remember which div is being shown and only hide that one and then only show the new one that I want to show? And the answer is yes. Um, that's the short answer. <laughs> all right. Here's the long answer. Um, I had a professor, and I, and I, and I still remember this, this, this quote to this day. I, I might not get the exact wording, but I definitely get the message right. Um, he said,
said something to the effect of, and this was back in the 19, you know, this is, this is a long time ago, right? But, uh, and, and this is back when writing efficient code was like real important because you had your machines that like had sundials inside as their <laughs> clock speed, right? You know, they move slow compared to they, today's machine. But the quote he had is, more mistakes have been done in the name of efficiency than any other reason, including blind stupidity. And I don't know if that's actually true. I, I think he was just trying to make a point. But let's think of mistakes that have been made in the name of efficiency. Can anyone name the most famous mistake made in the name of efficiency relating to computers? <laughs> he said Facebook timeline. No, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. If you can think of it now, try to imagine what you were doing 12 years ago or 12 yeah, you know, you were, yeah, you were, yeah, you were probably watching Rugrats, right? I was sorry. Yeah, the Y2K. That was done in the name of efficiency, right? right, right. <laughs> you know. Programmers in the 60s says, oh, why bother storing the first two digits of the date? You know, if, it, if it's 1971, we'll just store 71. Not realizing that, you know, 30 years from then, that's not such a good idea. Because it's then impossible to differentiate between 1971 and 2071. All right? And we all know what happened at Y2K. It, it brought down civilization as we know it. All right? Well... <laughs> It didn't really do that, but think of all the programmer hours that were spent testing and, and changing and, and altering things so that those problems didn't happen. In fact, one of the things with, uh, one of the, one of the uh, um, reasons given for the, uh, the, 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 the web uh, or, or the dot net crash around that time where as sort of web uh, companies, you know, there was sort of a little lag, you know, the web started out strong and then kind of had a little bit of a lag and all that, is that businesses weren't investing in new development because they were going back and fixing all their old development, right? So that was done in the name of efficiency and you know, that proves to be a huge problem. Now, getting back to your question that you asked 30, 35 minutes ago, <laughs> all right? Your question of could I remember which one I've shown and then only hide that and only show the new one. Yes, you can. Would that be more efficient to do it that way? Yes, it would. All right? Doing one instruction instead of 20. Now, what I would say is, how much more involved would the code be? All right? Eh, moderate, you know, slightly more involved, moderately so involved, especially at the beginner's level. You know what? To hide 20 divs as opposed to hiding one div, is a negligible speed improvement uh, on the browser. You know, that can happen, that happens like that. So, why bother? All right? That works. It, it works. It, it's not elegant, perhaps, so it might not be quite as good a solution, but it works and it's really easy to code. If it's really easy to code, it's really easy to see what you've done and, and change it. Yes? Uh, well, I know it is. Not really, because the, the remember on a dial-up connection, the code is still executing on the browser. So, you know, um, one line of code versus 20, you know, you'd be talking about 80 bytes as opposed to 1600 bytes. Not, not a, a, a big difference. All right. Um, so yeah, yes it would be better, yes it would be a more elegant solution. Um, is it worth the trouble? Not at this point of the game, anyhow. All right, good question. Are there other questions? Well, as I, as I promised, I would have a short lecture today. By short, I only went four minutes over my allotted time. All right. <laughs> so, we'll, we'll, no, I mean, I, I, you know, all kidding aside, 
And again, you know that because the, the evaluations are in and you can't, you can't uh, rescind yours. Uh, this has been a great class. I've, I've loved working with this class. This class typically is one of my funnest classes to teach. And you folks especially, and I extend that to the online people as well, were, were a lot of fun to work with. So uh, good luck. Um, you know, um, if you ever need anything from me, if you have questions, regardless of whether you're in my class or not, um, send me an email. All right. We'll see you in lab.